Okay, you can probably hear me now, uh, but let me uh, try to get my headphones uh, working. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I was a few minutes late and now I'm having some trouble with the audio, uh, but just a minute. Well, it should be gone probably. Okay. You're audible now. Hello? Okay. All right, I uh, won't use my headphones. You may hear some extraneous sounds. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you confirm on the chat that you can hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Uh, and since I can't use my headphones, you might hear a few sounds, but uh, hopefully it won't be too distracting. Uh, so as I was saying, what I was saying was that <clears throat> uh, we're going to discuss Feynman diagrams and this is going to give us a way to uh, Rederive some of the things we've already learned using the Hunter Fock method, uh, and also a way to extend that to higher orders. Uh, so the formula is a bit heavy, uh, and I'll try to simplify as much as I can. And uh, in the end, we just get a set of rules that you can look up uh, in any textbook. Uh, and then it allows us, at least in principle, to extend things to higher order and improve the results we have already. Um, and even for the experimentalists who don't necessarily want to learn all this uh, in great detail, uh, it's good to know the language uh, and uh, it improves, I think, uh, physical thinking and what's going on. Okay, so I, uh, towards the end of last class, um, I had talked about <coughs> uh, time evolution operators in both the Heisenberg uh, and the interaction representation. Uh, but the new twist that we haven't met so far uh, is that we consider time evolution in imaginary time tau. So there's no eyes floating around. Um, and this makes actually life a much simpler and setting up Feynman diagrams and perturbation theory uh, because you can express everything uh, in terms of traces of operators with a partition function. And traces are a lot easier to take than to take infinities where you prepare the system in some state at time equals t equals minus infinity and evolve, uh, evolve in the future. I mean, that's the way it's normally done in the quantum field theory textbooks. But I think now in modern perspective is that, <clears throat> you know, we shouldn't be so scared of imaginary time uh, and just, just work with it. And in the end, we'll relate imaginary time to real time by using the spectral functions that we learned about in last lecture. So anyway, so you have a Heisenberg time evolution in imaginary time, and you have the interaction picture in imaginary time, and you have a time evolution, uh, uh, evolution operator in imaginary time. Uh, and then by the same tricks that we learned earlier, you can write the time evolution operator as the time order product of the exponential uh, of the potential. So one immediate benefit of this uh, <coughs> imaginary time evolution uh, is that you can write the partition function uh, as the trace uh, of the time evolution operator in the interaction representation times the free Hamiltonian, which we know how to take care of. Um, so we can set up a completely systematic perturbation theory, as we'll see for the partition function at any temperature T and you can see that the temperature now appears, this temperature beta, which is one over T, appears as a time, because you want to evolve in an imaginary time, uh, or a length beta. Uh, and the trace means, roughly speaking, the time is going in a circle, and as that's something you're going to see today, 
uh, all the functions we're going to meet are periodic or anti-periodic in time as you move on the circle uh, of length beta. Okay, so that's where we were at the end of last lecture. So now let's define uh, a Green's function. Uh, you have two op operators, A and B. In general, there'll be creation or annihilation operators of fermions or bosons. And the Green's function of A and B is defined to be minus the time order product of A of tau and B of tau prime. Okay, so this is in the full Heisenberg time evolution. Uh, this is what we define. I mean, so there is no conceivable experiment that measures this thing. Uh, but at this point, you can view it as just a very useful thing to define uh, because as if, you know, we see here that we had a time order product in the time evolution operator. Then if you also compute other time order products, what happens is that when you take the product of two operators, this is time ordered and that, that's time ordered and you bring them together, you can freely uh, commute them through inside uh, because uh, it's the time ordering symbol that tells the ordering. So you don't have to worry about which order you write them. And so many useful identities then become uh, apparent. So that's, you can view that, that's why we are computing this silly thing because uh, it just turns out to a very straightforward expansion in perturbation theory. Uh, so, okay. All right, so this is what it is. And more formally, this is the expectation value at a temperature beta of the full Hamiltonian of this time order product. Okay. Um, also the time ordering uh, is defined in a way that every time you move a fermionic operator past another fermionic operator, uh, you pick up a minus sign. Okay. So now you take uh, this expression uh, and then you take this expression here for the time evolution of any operator in terms of u hat, uh, and you put them all together. Uh, and this is done in much detail in the book. So you have to evaluate uh, uh, this thing here. So you have an e to the minus beta h here and various u hats of time tau and u hats of time tau prime and so on. Uh, then you're converting the full time evolution to the interaction operator, which you know, you know the time evolution of the interaction operator, that's really simple. Uh, so you put that all in there and you manipulate very straightforward manipulation. Basically the rule is you can just assume everything commutes because everything is inside the time ordered symbol. Uh, and when you do that, you get a very simple expression here. Oh gosh, am I missing some hats? Uh, shouldn't there be hats here? Uh, okay, <laughs> um, there better be hats, otherwise this is not very useful. So let me just uh, look that up. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure there are hats, but let me confirm that uh, from the book. Uh, well, okay, I'll confirm it later. I'm pretty sure there are hats here. Uh, and if there aren't, I will send you an email <laughs> and I'll correct it on the website, okay. So, so you get the, uh, this correlation function you have to evaluate where all of the, the difficult part, the fact that there's an interaction that involves uh, four Fermi operators is all inside uh, this, uh, this U hat of B0. So this is the object you have to evaluate. You know, this thing U hat of B0, which is right here, uh, this expression here, uh, and then you have your operators, A hat and B hat, uh, which are just in the interaction representation so you can compute the time evolution. Okay, so now you can uh, expand out this thing, expand out U hat as written over here, uh, and really even write it as an uh, explicit series. Yeah, no, there definitely is a hat there. So you expand out U hat, so this is just the usual exponential. And again, we don't have to worry about ordering of operators and non-commuting because everything is set by the time ordering symbol. Uh, and so you have to evaluate all of these terms for this correlation function uh, with A hat and B hat and N B hats. So that's the general expression for the, at least the numerator uh, of this uh, correlation function. And similarly, you have to also expand the denominator and then take the ratio. Okay, so you know, 
if you remember how we needed perturbation theory in, uh, uh, in quantum mechanics, what a mess that was, even just going to first or second order. Uh, and it's, it's really the power of the time ordering trick that allows you to write expressions to all orders, um, uh, which are so compact. Uh, so this is just, uh, and that's really why we are defining these time ordered correlation function because they have a very simple uh, expansion uh, in this manner. Okay. All right, any questions? All right, so now that we have these definitions of a general Green's function, uh, they obey certain properties. Uh, one of the most important is sometimes called the kubo martin schringer periodicity or KMS periodicity, uh, which follows just from these definitions here. Uh, and again, I'm going to not go through the steps. It's, these are simple manipulations of the expression that I've already given you. It's just important to know about what the main result is. First of all, this correlation function uh, for a time independent Hamiltonian, which we are going to assume from now on, uh, is only a function of the time difference. This is not obvious from the way we wrote it, uh, but you can go back and, and manipulate it and see that it's indeed the case. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so only a different function of tau minus tau prime. And we are going to, when we take Fourier transform, not probably not today in the next lecture, just have to remember that this tau is always limited in the fundamental domain, which goes from minus beta to beta. Uh, and in this fundamental domain, uh, there's a basic periodicity called this KMS periodicity. That if you, so here's the fundamental domain from minus beta to beta of tau minus tau prime. And if you take this correlation function in this region, from minus beta to zero, it's very simply related to the correlation function in this region. Uh, and basically it's periodic for bosons and anti-periodic for fermions. Uh, and this is fun. Uh, and so you basically have to translate tau minus tau prime by beta, you shift it forward in time uh, by time beta. Uh, let me close the door, there's a little noise coming in. <laughs> Okay, all right, and, and this beta here is very much coming from, you know, this, this beta over here, uh, which ultimately is coming from this beta over here. So basically, uh, as you move this A through the trace, uh, then uh, you pick up an extra time beta, depending on which way you are, you know, whether tau is bigger, whether, when you add you move, when you add time beta to A of tau, uh, that gives you the same result uh, by the period, by the, uh, well, it's very much connected to the, this beta over here. Let me just leave it at that. So, so I haven't gone through the, the derivation. Um, the derivation basically, you, uh, the one basic thing to use is, is the fact that uh, that trace, you know, you keep, you can use this fact very freely, trace of A, B, A and B or any operators is the trace of B, A. Um, so you can, uh, and you can move, or, or if you have three operators tail of A, B, C, uh, that's the same as trace of C, A, B, and so on. Okay, so you use tricks like this, and uh, then you can uh, basically prove this KMS periodicity. Again, if you want to see the details, I refer you to the textbook. You know, I, I, if I spend time proving all this, we'll never get anywhere, and the whole course will become one of formalism. These are relatively easy things to prove, and, uh, but it takes, takes a little time to carefully go through them. All right, so then what we have to evaluate now is something like this. This is the, this is the time order product that we're going to evaluate, where uh, you know, A hat and B hat are like C dagger and C, for example, in the most common case, and V has four operators, C dagger, C dagger, C, C. So basically you have a string of a large number of Cs and C daggers sitting here. It's at different times top. And you have to evaluate this expectation value uh, now in the, in, the, 
in the free Hamiltonian. So this is really, I should put a zero over here. Uh, just like there was a zero over there, meaning that it's, it's in just expectation with respect to H zero. So uh, at least in principle, this term is evaluable. It's like if you have a harmonic oscillator and I give you a string of 10 A's and 10 A daggers, you, after a lot of hard work, you can probably get the answer. Just keep using commutation relations and so on. Uh, so the, all of that work with commutation relations has been done for us in some very efficient way uh, in, and encapsulated in something called Wick's theorem. So this is the most important thing that uh, we're gonna to discuss today, uh, which eventually leads to an understanding of what diagrams are about. So consider some arbitrary product, A hat, B hat, C hat, D hat, D. You know. So these are operators uh, which are single fermions or bosons, okay? Uh, and everything we meet, you know, eventually can be written this way. That uh, we have 10 operators here, 15 operators. After a while, you're not scared with them because in the end, you just draw them as pictures. Okay, so given a given some long product like this, uh, you define something called the contraction. So the contraction is basically the Green's function I showed you earlier, uh, but it's evaluated with the free Hamiltonian H naught. So this is the the G zero or the, the zeroth order Green's function when V is zero. So th th this is defined as the contraction of A hat times B hat T prime. It's, it's equal, it's defined to be exactly this, okay. So now we have to evaluate this time dependent correlation function uh, all, always in the zeroth Hamiltonian. Um, in, you know, this is the full Hamiltonian, that's hopeless, but these are just time evolution in H0 and we have some trace E to the minus beta H0 of the products of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. Okay, so the answer is extremely simple. This is equal and it's a, it's a version of, it's a more general version of a thing we have met before when we were doing Hartree-Fock, we were just factorizing in all possible ways. And that's basically Wick's theorem. Uh, it says this is equal to sum over products of all possible pairs of contractions. Uh, and for each product, there's a parity that you have to worry about, which is minus one to the parity of the contraction. So let me just illustrate this. So if I have A, B, C, D, uh, what is one possible contraction? So you have to contract every operator. So every operator has to contract with somebody. So A contracts here with B and C contracts with D. So that's the simplest possible contraction. And maybe there's E that'll contract with F and so on and so forth. Everything has to contract with something. So that's one of the contractions. And every time there's a contraction, you're going to get replaced it by the right-hand side. It's some function that we'll evaluate uh, next lecture. We'll know exactly what this function is. Okay, so for now, we just leave that aside. We just say, okay, it's equal to that correlator here and this one here. So that's one contraction, but there are many others. So here's uh, another contraction where A contracts with C and B contracts with D and so on. Uh, some of these contractions will be zero, but for now let's imagine they're all non-zero. So you have to look at every one of them. And now this is, this is an odd contraction if these are all fermions. And that's why I put a sign plus minus one here that's because to obtain this contraction, so the way you figure out the parity, just start moving the operator so that you only contract things that are right next to each other. So if I move the C, it goes through the B, it comes here, and then it's A, C, B, D. You now everything is next to each other. So I had to do one fermion interchange. So that gives me a minus one. So this, that's why this would have a minus one for fermions. Uh, this is another contraction, but A goes through D and B goes through C. Uh, and uh, this doesn't have a minus sign because D will go through two of these, the B next to A, uh, and that doesn't pick up a sign because whether they are fermions or boson, that's an even number of interchanges. Okay, and so on. So here A contracts with B and C could, could contract with something out here and D could contract with something out there and so on. Uh, if they were only, they were, if the dot, dot, dots weren't there, uh, then there are three possible contractions. 
So this would remind you of the Hartree Falk where you had A dagger, B dagger, C, D, and you contracted two ways there. Uh, but we didn't have the third one because that would be a contraction with A dagger with B dagger, and that's not allowed. So this one in the Hartree Falk would be thrown out because it's just zero. But for now, I haven't told you which is an A and which is an A dagger. This is a much more general statement. Uh, and uh, okay. So there it is, uh, that, that's the basic result. And so now I've given you a prescription for computing this Green's function. All you need to be able to compute is this basic object, this contraction between two operators. We'll do that next time, that's easy enough because it's just free fermions and free bosons. And these are just C and C dagger. So it's just like time evolution of a harmonic oscillator is no more complicated than that. So you can compute this. And once you know this, well, then you know the Green's function to all orders in principle. Uh, basically, you take you you take this infinite series, uh, which has uh, you know you take the nth order term, which would have n plus two operators. Each of the v's has four fermion anti fermion operators, so the total number is four n plus two operators here. Uh, and then you can there's some factorial number of contractions. And so you know that term as just a product of contractions and do that to every term. You do that to the denominator, uh, put it all together and you're done. Okay, so, so basically as far as formally setting up the problem, there it is, we have the answer. Okay, but as you can see, that's extremely tedious, even for a computer. Uh, we can teach a computer to do these things. Uh, and uh, you can get an answer in the end. Uh, but it just takes a lot of work. And so everything we're going to talk about now for at least the rest of this lecture uh, is, are just tricks, tricks that help us uh, simplify this very complicated expression that they've got. There's no more physics. These are just very clever tricks that people have developed over the past 20, 30 years, maybe longer, uh, that, you know, make the, uh, give you, make this whole process a bit more efficient and a bit more intuitive because we, we are much, I mean, by drawing pictures because our brains, uh, you know, can process pictures much more than horrible long expressions like this. Okay, any question? But that the principle of what I'm doing is not any, you know, is all here. This is, this is it as far as the physics is concerned. Uh, now it's just a matter of uh, applying these rules. Okay, but before I apply the rules, uh, I promised uh, I will, let's prove Wick's theorem. Okay, so here I have taken the liberty of just copying some pages from Federer and Valetka. There's also a proof in uh, Bruce and Flensburg in the imaginary time. Uh, it's slightly different, but I, I like this one a bit better. So let me just uh, discuss the proof. So the basic proof uh, is, kind of what I said, uh, what you do, so you're evaluating something like this, some expression like this of A, B, C, all the way up to F, as they say here, some expression like this. This is for, this row hat is E to the minus beta H naught, this object here, or as, as uh, they say here. The E to the beta omega naught is the denominator, but we won't worry about that, okay. The K naught is what I'm calling H naught. Okay, so the basic trick would be just use commutation relations. You take the A, you move it through B, you move it through C, all the way through, maybe through F, and then you move it through here and you bring it back. And when you do that, uh, you use the cyclic property of the trace and you end up with the expression you started with. Uh, and that gives you an induction uh, result that you can then evolve, apply again and again to get Wick's theorem, basically. <laughs> All right, so let, let me just get, go through their, uh, their proof. But that was the idea. We're just going to keep commuting this through, keeping track of all the commutation relation and take it around in a circle. And that leads to a proof uh, of this theorem. And if you take the limit of this as, you know, beta goes to infinity at zero temperature, uh, you basically end up with the hartree fock factorization rule, which I just kind of didn't even prove. So I feel obligated to finally prove this in its more general context. So you can see how it's done. Okay, so they define a contraction by putting dots. I guess it's simpler in the uh, 
respect to two operators. So there's one dot that means those two have been contracted. Uh, exactly what I said, the time order product of A hat and B hat. Okay, oops. Okay, so this is the theorem that uh, sum over all possible contractions. So here A is contracted with B because there's one dot, C is contracted with something else, so two dots, and so on. Highly unclear the notation. <laughs> the lines, the hooks, is much clearer. Anyway. Okay, so this is what they want to prove. All right. So, so the first thing that they, you know, these these A's and B's could be any any operators, uh, of which are linear combinations of the basic creation of an operator, which they call alpha J. Alpha J is A or A dagger, where A is what I call C. Uh, so there's various. Uh, you can expand every one of these in terms of the alpha J. Uh, and you expand it out. And then you can see that this identity uh, is linear in every, any one of the operators. So it has one power of A. This term has one power of A. Every term has one power of A. Every term has one power of B. Every term has one power of C. Uh, so in fact, you can add and you can multiply uh, or take sums of different operators in each element A, B, and C. Uh, without any trouble on both sides. So you can see from that, because it's a linear and linear identity, uh, that as long as you prove it for the alpha j, uh, you prove it for any other operator, which is a linear combination. So that's what they, they go through some formality with that. Uh, and then, okay, so in the end, what you have to do is evaluate uh, Yeah, this kind of, of of you know alpha a, alpha b, alpha c up to alpha f, some trace of this. Now, what about the time ordering? Well, okay, you 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 do give me some time ordering. You order the operators in the right order, and I prove it for that ordering. So I'm just going to I'm going to assume now, and just drop the time ordering symbol that alpha f is at an earlier time as alpha e, which is earlier than uh, you know, which is earlier than that, and this is the latest time. If it wasn't that way, I just I change the labels, call the other ones A and B. So this is now already time ordered, so I don't have to worry about the time ordering symbol. Okay. So this is what we have to evaluate. And now you do what I just said. You take alpha A through alpha B. When you do that, you'll pick up the commutator or anti-commutator of alpha A with B. Then you take it through alpha C, then you'll pick up the commutator of alpha A with alpha C. And finally, you take it through alpha F, and you pick up the commutator of alpha A with alpha F. <coughs> and so it ends up at the very end, okay? So alpha A started here, and it's equal to sum of all of these terms with the commutators, and alpha A is at the very end, okay? Now, all of these terms, these commutators, these are just numbers, like plus or minus one, basically, all of these. Uh, are they, or actually, you know, depending on whether it's a A or A dagger. <clears throat> so these, are, or, or it could be zero if they're both A daggers. Uh, so these are just numbers, so you can just collect all of them. And now the nice thing about all of these terms uh, is they have two fewer operators. You started out with, uh, you know, let's say 10 operators here. Now here we've removed A and B, so we have only eight operators left. Every one of these terms is only eight operators left. So it's simplified. Uh, and so you can play the same tricks on those. So that's, that's where the induction comes in. The only thing that's troublesome is this one. This still has 10 operators. Okay, but now you use the cyclic property of the trace. You take the alpha A and put it over here on the left and then take it through the row G0. And when you do that, you can use this identity. This is just like the imaginary time evolution of an operator in of a harmonic oscillator. So when you evolve alpha A with time beta, you just get alpha A times beta times the energy of that operator. And I guess lambda A is one of its creation and minus one of its. So this is just a statement that A dagger has e to the i omega t for harmonic minus i omega t for i omega t for harmonic oscillator and A has e to the i omega t. So this is the time evolution of a harmonic oscillator operator for boson and just for fermion, the rule is the same. Uh, you get just alpha A times beta times the energy Ea. 
here the the Hamiltonian K naught. I should write this down. Um, sorry, here the Hamiltonian K naught is sum on A. Um, E A. Um, well, what is the notation? Alpha A was A. Yeah. Okay. Someone E A. So no, I think their notation is also not entirely consistent. So they call it J. Someone J E J A dagger J A J. So that's what the E J are. Okay, so so that's great. So you can and you can use this this relationship here to commute the alpha a through the rho g zero. So when you do this, the last term. Okay. Okay, the last term here uh, becomes so when when you take uh, this operator, which is now on, on the before the rho g zero, you're not going to put it back here. You're going to pick up this factor. Okay. Um, you're going to pick up this factor here, uh, and uh, but then you're going to get back uh, what you had uh, in the beginning. This object. So now that's great. We can take it over to the left hand side. It's on the right hand side. You have all these terms you don't know. You know this term, but that's equal to has the same form as that except a factor. So you take it over to the left hand side, uh, and then you get an answer. So this is the basic answer. Uh, as I say, it's the important result. This is what we've been trying to prove. So here now on the left hand side, uh, you have the trace over, let's say, 10 operators. But on the right hand side, every term uh, has eight operators. So you've reduced, basically you've reduced it. And this object, uh, as we'll see, it's exactly equal to, we haven't evaluated that. This is just the contraction of A with B. So this object is what we're gonna define uh, to, be, to be equal to uh, alpha A contraction with alpha B in our notation. And similarly, this is a contraction with A with C, this is a contraction with A with F, and so on. So basically, all the contract A has been contracted away with everything, and you're left with the other operators. And now you keep doing this over and over again. I guess they, they, say, they say that here. So we define the contraction in A and B to be this object. And that will be the full answer of all of these ones. So by definition, that is the time ordered Green's function, and we're going to use this later on. So we also evaluated the contraction of these two operators, is this thing. Uh, and we'll see that again more, more, you know, using more elementary techniques tomorrow or Friday. So this, so we have contracted away alpha A and alpha B, and we have this result here, uh, where this product of a uh, large number of operators is the sum of various terms uh, which consists of contraction of A with every every other operator times the same thing uh, with the remaining terms. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. All right. So that's basically the proof, uh, and then we're going to look at these expressions uh, more more later tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now you can go back to the old operators and prove the whole thing. But that's this is the basic identity uh, that that basically establishes what the uh, Wick's theorem. Okay, it was just nothing but an exercise in commutation relations, and there's no subtleties of i epsilon is going to plus infinity and minus infinity and so on and so forth. If you look up the field theory books, it looks some, so much more messy and something very mysterious. As you can see, it's, it, when you work in imaginary time at finite temperature. It's completely straightforward uh, and simply involves just repeated rule use of uh, commutation relation. <clears throat> I mean, that actually, we also see this, you know, it's also much simpler than the Hartree Fock calculation. The Hartree Fock calculation of the slated determinant, 
and, and then you have to expand the federal determinant and prove all kinds of things, that's quite a mess. Uh, uh, the, the, the trick here is to go to finite temperature. And when you go to finite temperature, you have some you know, trace e to the minus beta h. Uh, and traces are very easy to evaluate, like I've just shown you. You just move things through and you're all done. Uh, and then you can take the zero temperature limit by beta going to infinity uh, and get the answer at zero temperature. So in fact, that's one of the, uh, the advantages of working at finite temperature. Many identities are a lot simpler and much easier to prove. All right, questions? All right, so now we have proven Wick's theorem, and I think that's the end of this set of notes. So, so now we have basically, like I said a few minutes ago, we have a complete expression uh, for the Green's function, anyway, of two operators um, to, to all orders in V. Okay, so now let me actually bring in some notation. Uh, which is not here. Yeah. So now we're going to evaluate a particular Green's function. Uh, which, and then write the expression in terms of pictures. So we're going to define uh, in terms of the field operators, uh, G, I, you put a, uh, for generality, I've even put a spin on the labels, G sigma sigma of X tau x prime tau prime is minus uh, expectation value in the full time order product of psi sigma. This is the field operator. It creates a particle spin sigma. And how that's a particle spin sigma at position x time tau and psi dagger sigma prime of x prime tau prime. Okay, so this is the object we want to evaluate. Uh, and then we're going, you know, now we can write it out as this some ratio of two series. So here is written out with slightly different notation. I apologize, these are some of my older notes and I need to really clean up my, uh, my, my handwriting, but hopefully you can see it. So now in these notes following Fred and Valechka, I use Ks rather than Hs. So K naught is basically the Hamiltonian with the mu n subtracted uh, and K K1, which is the perturbation uh, is V in our older notation. I, I should really rewrite these notes and sorry, just, just too busy to do it over the weekend. So this is the basic object, the Green's function of psi, psi dagger at these two points. Uh, and it's equal to this, this expansion, uh, which is the numerator and divided by ZG. So there should be one over ZG up front, the grand canonical partition function, which is itself an infinite series. So you have an infinite series of the Vs I've already written and then Psi with Psi dagger. So there's no, oh gosh. Uh, there should be no psi over there, it's just psi. Okay. All right, so this is this is the expression. Um, and we want to now evaluate this with Big's theorem. Okay, and each one of the k's uh, has four Fermi operators in it. So it's just even writing this out is scary. Okay. So we're going to, what we're gonna do is write it out in terms, in terms of pictures and anyway. that make life a little simpler. So we have the, this G which is the ratio of two series and I divide the numerator and the denominator by uh, the partition function um, of the, <clears throat> of just H zero. The G here stands for grand canonical ensemble. Okay, just divide it. And then I'm going to call the numerator G tilde. And, and this is the ratio of the partition functions of H and H zero. Okay, so G tilde is the expectation value of this series in the numerator in the H zero Hamiltonian uh, uh, here. Okay, we already know that. All right, so let's take the very first term, the first order term. 
uh, in this expansion, we have only one power of k. Okay, so one each each k each interaction has four fermions, so we'll end up with six Fermi operators. That's already pretty scary. So this is the x and x prime that you're interested in, uh, and then the interaction will have x1, x2, x2, x1. So the interaction. Let's remember what the interaction term is. Um, the interaction term here, k1. Uh, it's something like one half dx d. dx prime psi dagger of x tau psi dagger of x prime tau prime then some interaction which will be one over x minus x prime for the coulomb interaction and then you'll get psi of x prime tau there's only one time the times are all the same in the interaction uh, And so you have x tau, uh, and you can also put in the spins. So this is sigma sig, sigma prime, sigma prime, sigma. Okay, so that's the Coulomb interaction, the second quantized form. Uh, so it has these four sides, uh, and then pull them together, uh, and I get this 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 term here. Okay. So now I, 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 and here, the interaction here I've taken to be an arbitrary interaction V of X1 minus X2. Okay. So, so this, this part out front, the zero to the integral of tau one comes from the integral uh, in the expansion here from this, this integral uh, and the integral over, um, over x1 and x2 comes from this integral over here, which I call x and x prime. Okay, so there's various integrals. Uh, and then there's the, some, the product of these six operators. So how many contractions there are between six operators? Well, that's quite a large number. Uh, so you have to six choose two and then four choose two. And so, okay, that's quite a large number, uh, but a lot of them are just zero. And that's something basically we already know that the contraction of psi with psi and psi dagger with psi dagger is always zero. Uh, that's because of uh, you know the Hamiltonian conserved particle number. So, so let's we haven't quite computed them, but we'll see that soon enough. So so basically when you're done, how many things are left over? Well, there's six terms left over the six possible contraction, which I have laboriously written out over here. And these are written in terms of G zero because that's the Hamilton, the Green's function in the zeroth order Hamiltonian. So for example, in this term A, I've contracted X with X prime. Uh, so that's a contraction of this with this. Uh, and then, um, well, okay, so here, I contract uh, X1 with X1. So that's a contraction probably uh, of uh, this one with this one and this one with this one and this one with that one. So that's one contraction. That's term A. Uh, what's term B? I think that's this one. And then you have something like this and this one. Okay, that's term B. Then you have term C. Well, okay. So <laughs> That's x tau with x prime, x one tau one. So that's, uh, so you're going to contract this with that. And now you have two other possibilities. And then finally you contract this with one of these. So you see there's six of them. Okay, just even writing them out with so many indices is extremely tedious. So A, B, C, you have A, B, C, D, E, F. Those are the results of the Wick's theorem expansion. Okay, so now we represent the same picture, picture. We don't want to draw all these indices and all these Green's functions. We're going to represent from the pictures. So here's our Feynman diagram. So we represent the interaction 
by this object, this wavy line. Uh, and each vertex here has some time. So this is the interaction. You have a side, you know, you have x1 tau1. And the other time is also is x2 tau1 because the interaction is instantaneous, has the same time. And this is the, eventually we'll think of as the photon, okay. Uh, and then at these interaction times, you have a psi dagger and a psi. So you represent a psi by an arrow going in and a psi dagger with an arrow going out. So you have this psi arrow particle being highlighted and particle being created. So this is this, it's just a pictorial way of writing down uh, this expression here, it's nothing but that. Okay, then the Green's function uh, we will represent by a line. So this is G0, which is the bare Green's function in the H0. It's a line going from here to here, sort of this way. Okay, from X prime tau prime to X tau. Okay, so that's the picture. So what is diagram A? So if you look at A, how would I draw A in picture? So A, I have a Green's function going from X tau to X time tau prime. And then I have, you know, Green's function going, uh, you know, I have a Green's function going like this, like this, and like this. So every time there's a contraction, you draw the line connecting those particles. So that, pick, that particular term becomes this diagram. You have the Green's function going on its own. You had this interaction and then you just contract this this way and this this way, and that gives you a green spot. So if I draw this picture here, this picture of the two diagrams together, so it's what we call a disconnected diagram, it has two disconnected pieces. So that's the term A. It has a factor of G naught this way, and a factor of G naught here, and a factor of G naught here, and a factor of V here. That's what this diagram represents. Then how about the integrations? Well, the rule is if there's any space-time position that's inside the graph, not external, like you integrate over it. So here x1 and tau1 and x2 and tau1 are integrated over. Uh, and any, same with spin indices, any spin indices that are inside you integrate over, the external indices you don't integrate over because the external indices uh, have to do with the thing you're computing. You know, you're computing this Green's function. It's a function of those external indices, wherever that is, this thing x tau and x prime tau prime are our external indices. Okay, so that's diagram A. It's this disconnected diagram. Uh, by the same rule, you can see diagram B is this thing, where now you go across. This is, you know, this is sort of like the Hartree term. This is sort of like the Fock term when we're taking expectation values of the interaction. Uh, these are disconnected diagrams and we'll see very quickly that those are not so interesting. Uh, the other, now we had six other diagrams, four other diagrams. Uh, those are much more interesting. Um, this is the other one. So you have a particle moving along, then it, you know, you know, you have what you take your external line, you put it in here, then you go here, and then this contracts with that, and then this one contracts with the external side. So that's this this diagram here. It's connected, there's only one piece of it, all the three Green's functions, there are three Green's functions here and one. Uh, and this is the other one uh, with a slightly different putting together of lines. Uh, and the other, and the fourth and the fifth, actually they, once we draw them in pictures, you see that they look pretty much the same. This looks the same as that, uh, and this looks the same as that, uh, except that the indices are different. Somewhere there's X1 here, it's X2 and so on, but no worries because the internal indices are integrated over. So after we do the integration of these internal indices, these two things are obviously the same because they have, uh, you know, they're the same expressions except that the dummy variables of integration are different. Okay, so that's already you see, you know, it's much easier to draw these pictures. Uh, and secondly, uh, many terms which are the same, it becomes much clearer when you draw the picture that they're the same. Whereas just looking at this in this page, uh, you know, uh, I guess D is the same as F, 
uh, you could see that, but you'd worry that even uh, I made a mistake in some of the indices and the subscripts and so on. <laughs> so, but after you change variables of integration, you can see there that's same. And there's various minus ones that you have to pick up, uh, which we'll worry about later. Okay. So these are the six diagrams in the first order term. Okay, so we have evaluated the Green's function to first order, at least formally, uh, in the numerator. Okay. What about the denominator? We do the same trick in the denominator uh, and you'll get uh, three diagrams. And now there, there's no Green's function, everything is a trace. So what you find is that the diagrams don't have any external lines. They all just, they just close into themselves. This is two, fortunately there's only one, two terms uh, to first order in the interaction. Uh, right, so that's the denominator. So finally, you have to divide as here. You have this, I've evaluated the numerator as the sum of six diagrams and the denominator as the sum of two diagrams. And now you have to divide them and now everything is to first order in V. So if something is first order in the V, you know, the denominator is one plus V, well that should be written as one minus V. And you can expand it out to first order in V uh, you find another very beautiful thing happen that all the disconnected diagrams cancel. And this is actually something that happens to all orders. It's called the linked cluster theorem, which I will not prove. Uh, basically the linked cluster theorem says, don't worry about the denominator. Wick's theorem will take care of it. And when you're applying Wick's theorem to these expressions, only keep the connected diagrams. Uh, uh, so what happens is, you know, you have a zeroth order term in the numerator, which is this, this term right here. And this disconnected diagram here will cancel with this term times uh, this term in the denominator when you expand the denominator. Similarly, this one times the bare zeroth order Green's function will cancel with this disconnected diagram. So all the disconnect, and this actually happens to all orders. Uh, so all the disconnected diagrams cancel uh, and you can forget about the denominator uh, and only keep track of connected uh, diagrams. So that's already one of the big advantages of drawing pictures rather than actually doing the perturbation theory by hand. Uh, you only keep connected diagrams. Okay. Uh, and then after this, you can do this to higher orders and draw pictures at higher orders. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a set of rules that tells you, so you never ever really after this ever write down horrible expressions like this. Uh, you just draw pictures uh, and the connected diagrams at second order in V are already much more complicated. They'll have, you know, uh, expressions like this. This is, this is the first term at second order in V uh, that we haven't so far uh, really well, okay. We haven't really fully accounted for in anything you've done so far. And there's some other terms and we'll see a few of them later. Okay, I'm out of time. I'm sorry I started late. Uh, and we're going to continue this discussion on setting up diagrams and evaluating them uh, on, on Wednesday. Any questions? Okay, so, you know, uh, the book does cover all of this material, but it does uh, time-ordered real-time Green's functions before it gets to time-ordered Green's functions, uh, imaginary time Green's function, but, but you can skip ahead. You don't need to read that for now. Uh, let's see, I think it's self-contained along with the notes that I've given you. Okay then. Um, also one more thing uh, before we stop. Uh, I don't know, this, this 9 p.m. Uh, discussion is not, doesn't seem to be working very well. So I'm going to propose a new procedure where uh, I'm going to have a 9 a.m. discussion on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, that'll be better for people in Europe, I'm sure. Uh, and 9 p.m. on Friday. So I'll put this on Slack. Uh, and if you get confused on whether there's a discussion or not, uh, just go to the Zoom page uh, on the class website, on the Canvas site, and you know, you'll see them the Zoom link for any discussion session and when it's happening.
Actually, 9 a.m. on Thursday, we have sections. Oh, you have a section at 9 a.m. on Thursday, is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. Then back to square one. All right. I'll think about it. I'll, put, I'll make a proposal on, uh, on, on, uh, on Slack. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Sorry, I should have checked that. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Just, uh, yes. I was just curious if there's a PDF version of Federer and Waleka. It was like referenced for the third problem set um, as reading, but. Yes, uh, I do have a PDF version, but I, formally I can't use, you know, do Google, we can find it, but don't tell me, don't, don't say I told you to do that. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I found it on the web, it's available, <laughs> but. My formal advice is uh, look up the library or buy the book or come to my office and I'll lend you my copy. But yeah, I'm not in my office, but I can arrange to meet you and give you my copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I have, oh, the, in the problem set, yeah, there was reading, right? Yeah, I think, I, I think it'd be legal for me to just take that reading uh, and put that uh, put that PDF on the Canvas site. Just that chapter. That's fine. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, we'll have more fun with diagram next time, and uh, pretty soon you'll be drawing these pictures uh, without any problems. <laughs> okay. Talk to you later.